for cultivating progress across the South, for working to unconditionally improve the lives of all, and for the bold underwriting of every gravy podcast. SFA thanks our visionary Louisville, Kentucky friends, Pam and Brooke Smith. Almost a decade ago, November 20th, 2014 to be exact, we aired the very first episode of Gravy. And a lot has changed since then. Tina Antolini, Gravy's first producer and host, is now an audio producer for the New York Times. Melinda Maynard Lowry, a member of the Lumbee tribe whose voice and lived experience carries this story, is now the Cahoon Family Professor of History at Emory University. In the years since this story first aired, we've told hundreds more. Yet, we always return to this one. This Thanksgiving story is unlike the ones you likely heard in grade school. There's no construction paper and feather craft projects to adorn this table. And if you're listening to Gravy, you likely would not expect there to be. Because as we know, and you know, Thanksgiving is complicated for everybody. And especially for some Native Americans who, even when they celebrate Thanksgiving, must do it in the face of misconception and ignorance. You remember the whole grade school lesson about the pilgrims and the Indians on Thanksgiving, right? The turkeys, the belt buckles, the feather headdresses, the happy joint feast. Yeah, most of us know by now that it was way more complicated than that. But for some Native Americans, Thanksgiving is a window into the ongoing misperceptions of them, or even all-out ignorance. I mean, Europeans have had, since almost Columbus first arrived, this idea that in order to be Native, you had to stay in the past, that your culture had to remain unchanged. And all Native people change. You're listening to Gravy. 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 A production of the Southern Foodways Alliance, Gravy tells the story of the changing American South. I am Mary Beth Lassiter. I'm Melissa Hall. Tina Antolini has the story. We start with one Thanksgiving a number of years ago when Melinda Maynor Lowry was bringing a friend home to North Carolina for the holidays. Melinda's family is all in Robeson County in the southeastern part of the state. She was living across the country then, going to film school. And this friend was coming along to help shoot some scenes for a documentary Melinda wanted to make. And he just thought, he was from New York, he just thought it was so funny that he was going to get to spend Thanksgiving with the Indians. Like, isn't that ironic? I don't know, I just didn't really say anything. But then he said that to my dad when we were, like, actually in Robinson County on production. And my dad just looked at him and was like, well, it's a harvest celebration. We thank God for what he's given us. And my friend was like, oh, (laughs) like he had never really thought about, even though he was surrounded by Indians, it was in in this particular moment, it was almost like he had never really thought about Indian people as having a living relationship to a holiday like Thanksgiving. Melinda was surprised and not surprised. This was not the first time she'd had to educate friends about who she was. I mean, when I first moved to the Northeast, People didn't believe that I was Native because I was from North Carolina. I mean, the, the line was, well, there aren't any Indians there. How can you be Indian? And the only thing they learned about Indians in school, maybe, was that we were removed from the Southeast and that there aren't any more of us here. If you need any proof that there are still Native people in North Carolina, that not everyone was removed through the infamous Trail of Tears, just visit Melinda's Grandma's Kitchen on Thanksgiving morning. It is packed. There's like eight or ten people in there, it's not a big space, doing different jobs. In particular, the dishes that everybody values so much, like our collard greens or cornbread or sweet potato casserole. Those are Melinda's aunts singing gospel tunes while they fry cornbread. There's no better way to explain how Lumbee people have survived to be who we are than to show these two activities taking place simultaneously, singing and cooking our cornbread. Gospel tunes and fried cornbread not exactly fitting your mental image of a Native American? Try the rest of the Lumbee Thanksgiving spread. Oh, fried chicken. Chicken and pastry. Fried chicken, baked chicken, like braised chicken. Fried chicken. People will bring anything related to chicken. 
to Thanksgiving. And you ever heard of fat back? <laughs> you definitely fry some fat back. Yeah, I mean, fat back is like a, it's its own food group here, you know. <laughs> you might bring something like fried okra. All rutabagas. Corn off common on top. You probably had a ham too because we're North Carolinian, so we had ham too. Somebody probably bring collards and cornbread. We ate cranberry sauce out of a can because I didn't know what a cranberry was. I didn't see a cranberry until I was about grown. It's always going to be the best cakes you've ever tasted. 13 layer chocolate cake. Hummingbird cake. We believe in having good pound cake. Pecan pie. We just love to eat, so. <laughs> So how did Native American food get to be so Southern here? Or, and this is a clue, is that not really the right question to be asking? You've got to start with the history of this particular community. So who are the Lumbees? My answer usually begins with the Lumbees are the largest tribe of Native Americans east of the Mississippi. In addition to being a member of the Lumbee tribe, Melinda is also a history professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She says there are more than 60,000 Lumbees, most of them in this one part of North Carolina, Robeson County. But their ancestors were from an area that spans Virginia, North Carolina, and part of South Carolina. You know, people believe that to be an Indian, you have to be a descendant of one historic tribe. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense to folks. But that's, of course, not our history. So our history is that we're descended from multiple historic tribes. They spoke several different languages, had different cultures. But then the Europeans showed up. We are the product of several centuries of warfare waged upon us as settlers tried to take over our lands and move in, but also of disease. The estimates are that smallpox and other diseases, infectious diseases, wiped out about 95% of some of the native populations in this part of the South. And so if you imagine a village of 100 people 95 of them are gone, and then the five are left to survive. And what they do is they begin moving, and they begin finding other survivors from other epidemics. And so this group of Indians was formed from the remaining members of other tribes. They eventually ended up in a part of North Carolina that was pretty much outside of colonial control. It was a swamp, and it wasn't a place for the most part, that Europeans really desired to be. They didn't know how to navigate that landscape, but we did. They didn't know how to farm in that landscape, but we did. People didn't really, they didn't know what to do with that territory, and so, but we did. <laughs> so we were there, you know, finding a safe place to be where we could kind of reform our community and um, have a bunch of babies over the following centuries. But, of course, they weren't in complete isolation in those swamps. Other people eventually ended up there, too. Who may have been escaped slaves, may have been white indentured servants who got their freedom and were poor like you and trying to get away from that bad situation. And so you had to go along and get along. You had to figure out how to survive. And, you know, part of that is food. You know, you might not have the food that you had before and you got to eat what they have. This is Jefferson Curry. He goes by Jeff. He's Lumby too, though he has an even tougher time than Melinda explaining to outsiders who he is. I will say I'm Indian, Lumby, and then people look at me funny anyway because I, I'm white-skinned, I look like a white guy. I've been told that. Um, I look at myself and I look like me. Case in point is that one Thanksgiving when he was a kid, Jeff was cast as a pilgrim in the Thanksgiving play. And I can still remember part of the song, I think. I think it said something like, I'm just a pilgrim boy sailing over the sea or something like that. You know, and, and I think about that often. Like, yeah, that was messed up, Mama. Um, kind of funny, you know. Jeff's now a folklorist who's made Native culture his focus. He says whenever you talk about Indians with non-native folks, there's usually a big fuss about authenticity. The irony is that some foods in the South that do authentically come from native people aren't often thought about that way. Corn is Indian. Maize, whatever, is Indian. It's been Indian. It was Indian. They didn't have it anywhere else. Anybody's eating corn, the way corn's fixed, we fix it that way. So. I think sometimes in the food conversation, corn is African-American, oftentimes. 
cornbread is is kind of like soul food staple. Okay, that's cool, but we gave it to them. The reality, Jeff says, is that what the Lumbee eat now is the product of having been here in North Carolina for generations with everyone else who's been here. Lumbee folks eat collards, and we eat okra. Well, we didn't eat that before African people got here, and we didn't eat wheat before white people got here, you know? And so it doesn't make you any less Indian, and it doesn't make them any less white or black, and it doesn't make us any less or more Southern. We're Southern, that's what you eat. But, you know, what is Southern food? It was just the bigger question. And Southern food is white, black, Indian. Indian, black, white. Black, Indian, white. Whatever you want, however you want to put it. It's all of those three things mixed together into this, like, slurry of of ingredients that were traded, stolen, you know, found or whatever. We're adapting in a lot of ways. You know, if you don't adapt, you die. I mean, that's just, it's like Anthropology 101. Adaptation is a theme that comes up when you talk to Lumbee folks about their history, having to deal with whatever is thrown at you, and also dealing with being invisible to the powers that be. Indian food being left out of the narrative of Southern food, that's part of a pattern of invisibility, Jeff says. We're here, we're not here, we're here, we're not here. That has certainly been the story in the more modern chapter of Lumbee history. Because the Lumbees didn't fit the federal government's notions of who Native people were, remember, they were an amalgam of many tribes, not one, they didn't have treaties, didn't get a reservation, so for a long time, it was kind of like they didn't exist. In fact, the government kept on changing what they were called. For years, it was the Croatans. Then, for reasons that were mysterious to pretty much everybody, that got changed to the Cherokee Indians of Robeson County which didn't really sit well with the Eastern Band of Cherokee. It was only in the 1950s that they became the Lumbee, naming themselves for the Lumber River that runs through Robeson County. Here's Melinda Maynor Lowry again. The Lumbees are stuck in this kind of odd relationship with the federal government where it's been obvious to many, many people over many, many decades that we are Indians. And so in 1956, the U.S. Congress passed an act, the Lumbee Act, saying, you are Indians, hi, thank you very much, but we're not going to give you any benefits or services normally designated for Indian tribes, which means that we're not going to acknowledge our government-to-government relationship with you. And so the Lumbees had to make do without any government support of the tribe. Many were sharecroppers with large families. They had to keep on adapting to survive. When we grew up, we didn't have enough food to eat. And so for us, it wasn't a matter of, is it lumby food or whatever. We were just thankful to eat. We were not wondering what kind of food it was. We were just wondering, is there going to be food on the table? Gloria Barton Gates is 69, old enough to remember a different time in Robeson County. When she was growing up, her family didn't celebrate Thanksgiving, not because they didn't believe in it, but because they couldn't afford to. There were nine kids. Everyone picked cotton, put in tobacco to help out. But often, they were just barely able to eat. I remember at one time, things were really tight, and my mother took cornmeal and made kind of a mush. Basically, it was cornmeal and water, some grease, and made like a soup out of that. And we ate that. And we were glad to get it. I mean, it doesn't sound that great now, but it, when we go home, it's like, you know, that was okay. It wasn't bad because that's what we knew. But there was another force outside of poverty that made Lumbee life the way it was, one that also has been left out of the narrative many of us have about the South. During her early childhood, Gloria's Indian identity wasn't even on her mind until one particular day. The first time I realized that I wasn't the same as everybody else, um, when we grew up in Pembroke, everybody we knew was the same as we were. And then when I was about 12 or 13, we heard that there was a grand dragon coming to Robinson County to put the Indians in their place. I didn't know what our place was. I didn't know what a dragon was. As it turned out, it was the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. 
and they burned a cross in somebody's yard because an Indian married a white guy. When we come back, we'll hear Gloria Barton Gates, a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, recount the day in 1958 that she realized she was Indian. That was the day the Ku Klux Klan showed up in town. But first... For over 125 years, Lodge has been crafting quality cookware in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. It started with the iconic Lodge cast iron skillet made for cooking anything anywhere and then turned to the seasoned cast iron Dutch oven and camp ovens. Now Lodge is making history with USA Enamel, the only line of colorful enameled cast iron made in the United States. And like all Lodge cast iron cookware, USA Enamel is designed to last for generations. Visit LodgeCastIron.com to purchase your own USA Enamel Dutch oven. For Lodge's longtime commitment to the Southern Foodways Alliance and this podcast, we thank them. So on that particular night, our neighbor came over who was a school teacher. I was over at my grandmother's, and he said, you know, there's going to be trouble getting the house, keep the doors locked, don't come out for anybody unless I come and tell you it's okay. And he said, there's going to be trouble tonight. We had no idea what he was talking about. As it turned out, the Klan got together. A few members of the Klan showed up, perhaps 100, but 300 Indians showed up. The Indians came with weapons. Okay, some of them had shovels, some of them had guns, different things. But what happened is when they got there, somebody shot the microphone and the Indians took the KKK flag. They took the flag and the Klan left. So they basically ran the Klan out of town, the Indians they did. did. They did. I didn't realize until afterwards what the fight was all about. And it was because one race was saying, our race is better than your race, and we don't want you intermingling. That moment of triumph over the Klan came in a really tricky time for the Lumbee. There were strict rules to prevent the intermingling of the races. Robeson County had its own spin on Jim Crow. We had uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, we had three races of, of folks here. I grew up as an Indian, and I, in my opinion, I didn't have the same privileges as uh, my white friends. Heaver Dobbs Oxendine Jr. grew up during the era of tri-racial segregation in Robeson County. For an example, we had a theater in Vermont. There's three races. The whites went downstairs, the blacks and Indians went upstairs. There were white, black, and Indian bathrooms, water fountains, schools, and restaurants. One of Mr. Dobbs Oxendine's uncles, Hilton Oxendine, decided to open a restaurant in Lumberton, the county seat of Robinson County, an Indian-owned restaurant. It was called The Old Foundry. And what's so unique, uh, I think, about the Old Foundry is the Indians can, couldn't go to a, a theater or a drugstore or other restaurants and, and, and sit down and feel comfortable or it was against the law for them to do it anyway. And the old foundry, it was welcome to Indians because the Indians, my uncle ran it, and we welcomed the white folks. And they they patronized it as well as the Indians. So they intermingled with the Indians. It was another symbolic victory, like running the Klan out of town. The Indians claiming their own space and inviting the white folks in. But doing that meant that they themselves excluded others. The blacks, we, they didn't come in like the Indians or the white folks. They were served in the back, and they got their food, and, and they would uh, take it with them. But I, you know, as I look back, um, that wasn't right. That was. We, we were practicing what was practiced against us with the, with the white folks. Melinda Maynard Lowry says this was the trade off of the Lumbee figuring out the way to survive this particular era of history. Having our own schools, having our own restaurants and other facilities in the town of Pembroke, 
really assisted in maintaining our autonomy as a native people who had been there longer than anybody else, you know, um, but whose land claims and so forth had not been recognized. So when our land claims were not recognized, we built our own other institutions where we were recognizing ourselves and we were forcing other people to recognize us. There was a flip side to all that. The separation gave the Lumbee an opportunity for advancement, but at a cost. That system of segregation really concedes whites' power to govern race relations. It means that you have to accept to a, to a certain degree that white people believe that you're racially inferior. At this point, these decades later, some of the Lumbee institutions that came out of that era are still around. The old foundry is closed, but the college the Lumbee started to educate Indian teachers has become the University of North Carolina Pembroke. There is a pride in this longevity, the Lumbee persisting despite hundreds of years of colonialism, disease, discrimination, lack of recognition. That pride is all wrapped up in the food. It gives it a context that, if you're an outsider, you might not recognize when you look at a plate of cornbread, collards, and pork, which are the ingredients of what's become one of the iconic Lumbee dishes in recent years, the collard sandwich. You cook the collards. Uh, once you've cooked those, cut them up. But you fry cornbread, but the cornbread is very thin. It's probably like pancake, uh, similar to that. And you make a sandwich as if it were light bread, but it's cornbread, and you put the collards between. And then on the very top, you, you have already fried some fat back, put a couple of pieces of fat back, and that's a sandwich. And having consumed three of them in a 24-hour period in Robeson County, I can confirm they are the smartest thing to do with these ingredients. A round of crisp cornbread gives way to the bittersweet greens with the salty crunch of the pork on top. It's actually a pretty recent innovation, people tell me. But it's representative of the tri-racial history that's intertwined with the Lumbee story and the story of Southern food. Yeah, the collard sandwich is a great mix of something that Europeans brought to the table, pork. Collards, which have been expertly cooked by African Americans for centuries. Thank God for that. And we wouldn't have cornbread, of course, without the corn that had been cultivated here for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. White, black, Indian. I mean, cornbread, collards, and pork. The collard sandwich is the perfect delivery vehicle for America, for the South, for Southern food. I mean, I think we should like put one in every hand and mouth. So, for your Thanksgiving this year, why not fry up some cornbread and layer it with collards and pork? Commemorate a real Indian experience, one that's not static or stuck in the past, but still evolving, as all of us are. Music for this episode was provided by Wendell Patrick, Tyson Rogers, courtesy of Diagram Collective, Sunday Ent, Michael Hurst, T-Bird in the Breaks, and Computer vs. Banjo. Our sponsorship music is by Jazar. Additional music, all the Lumbee singing you're hearing from Melinda Maynor Lowry's family and also her documentary film Sounds of Faith. Gloria Barton Gates has written a cookbook about Lumbee food. You can find a link to info about that, plus links to oral histories the SFA's Sarah Wood did with several members of the Lumbee tribe. That's on our website, southernfoodways.org slash gravy. Tina Antolini reported and produced this episode. Tina has worked in public radio for nearly 20 years. She was a senior producer for NPR's State of the Reunion, for which she won a Peabody and a National Edward R. Murrow Award for her work, and was the on-air host producer for All Things Considered at New England Public Radio. Tina has produced stories on everything from Iraqi religious minorities to the sex lives of lobsters. She attended Stanford, Hampshire College, and the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies. Managing Editor for Gravy and all other SFA media is Sarah Kent Milam. Olivia Terenzio is our podcast editor. My co-host, Mary Beth Lassiter, is our publisher. Gravy is proud to be a part of APT Podcast Studios. Want to learn more about the changing American South? Visit us at southernfoodways.org. Check out lectures from our recent events, watch films, or listen to this podcast. While you're there, become a member or make a donation. Your dollars fund our work and help us make more gravy. 
I'm Melissa Hall. I'm Mary Beth Lasseter. Excited to lap up another episode of Gravy? Tell a friend. Pass the gravy boat. There is plenty to go around.